Stefan Alonzo from Harvard will be telling us about swamp line conjectures for strings of membranes. OK, so first, uh, let me thank John and Cody for this opportunity and for organizing these uh, series of seminars. So I will try to illustrate the main results of this work that we wrote with Fernando Marchesano from Madrid, Luca Martucci from University of Padova, and Irene Valenzuela from Harvard. So to begin with, let us consider first particles in four dimensions. As you know, the back reaction of these particles is negligible as we move away from the particle. And this allows us, for instance, to define quantum states asymptotically. For instance, the physical quantities such as masses or charges are defined at infinite distance. On the other hand, let us consider strings and membranes. These are objects with co-dimension respectively two for strings and one for membranes. These have a drastically different physics because for both strings and membranes, the back reaction increases as we move away from the object. And uh, as I will try to show you later, for both strings and membranes, actually the space-time metric simply breaks down at a finite distance from the membrane, from the membranes or from the string. So there is an important question to be addressed, namely whether it does even make sense to include the strings and membranes in the effective description, because what the effective description inevitably breaks down. And as I will try to illustrate, by developing an uh, old idea by Polchinski, Goldberger, Goldberger, Gerwise, and some others. There is indeed a very clean uh, uh, correspondence between the back reaction of extended objects and the RG flow of the effective couplings. And uh, well, in order to have a framework which is uh, totally under control, I will always consider supergravity theories with every equal one supersymmetry. So the technology that we will develop will be extremely valuable for these one plane conjectures. And in particular, I will focus on first on two of these conjectures, namely the weak gravity and the repulsive force conjecture. These two conjectures both predict, in a sense, the existence of fundamental strings or membranes in the EFT. And uh, well, therefore, it is very important to know how the string tension and charges are defined within effective descriptions. We also know that. Uh, Potentially, all these uh, swamp and conjectures are uh, related among one another. And what I will try to show you is that uh, the physics of these extended objects with local dimension can be helpful in order to uh, thread the new links among this conjecture. In particular, with axionic strings, we can relate the weak gravity conjecture with the distance conjecture. And with membranes, we can relate the weak gravity conjecture, properly formulated for membranes, with the no decitor conjecture and eventually also the transplantian censorship conjecture. And to start, I will first consider strings and later I will move considering membranes. So let us first consider fundamental axionic strings. I will call them fundamental because they are included within the effective description as objects with strict co dimension two, or if you prefer, since we work in four dimensions, these are objects whose word sheet as a strictly dimension two. These objects are uh, electrically coupled to some sets of gauge two forms, with this ii being the uh, uh, electric charge, and they are magnetically coupled to some dual axions. Namely, once we encircle the string, the axions get shifted by the charge of the string. In order to treat these uh, strings uh, semi-classically within the effective description, we would actually need that the string tension as gre is greater than the cutoff squared in uh, such a way that we, uh, we can neglect within the effective description all the quantum oscillatory modes. Now, in order to embed these axionic strings in uh, a supergravity framework, we need a proper supersymmetric formalism, which is able to include this gauge two form in a supersymmetric fashion. And this can be obtained in this way. Let us assume to start with uh, an equal one supergravity theory formulated in terms of some uh, chiral multiplets. And uh, these complex uh, scalar fields phi i are split in an axionic part, which is just their real part, and in a transaxionic part, which is their imaginary part. This splitting is actually justified by the symmetries of the Keller potential, because the Keller potential just depends uh, from the saxions. 
This is true, for instance, in uh, some uh, string compatibility scenarios uh, where uh, we take, for instance, a large volume or a large complex structure limits while neglecting quantum corrections. Now, whenever this hypothesis holds, we can dualize the chiral multiplet to linear multiplets. And at the bosonic level, which will be for interest for us, this just means that the succions SI are replaced with some dual succions, which are just the derivative of the Keller potential with respect to the original succions. And the axions are instead replaced by some gauge two form. This is, uh, after all, just a, a pretty standard electromagnetic duality. Then we arrive at this dual action, which is fully expressed in terms of the dual succions and the gauge two forms. And importantly, supersymmetry fixes the kinetic uh, uh, matrix for the dual succions to be equal to the gauge kinetic matrix for the gauge two forms. Now, in this formulation, we can uh, include a fundamental string. The action of the string includes a minimal coupling with the gauge two form and an Arbuco two term, which uh, uh, is expressed in terms of the string tension. And supersymmetry fixes the string tension to be linear in the electrical charges and linear in the dual succions. And in this formalism, we can also easily identify the physical string charge, which is just given by the bare charges contracted with the gauge kinetic function. Now it can be seen that uh, this string tension obeys this identity tautologically, which relates the uh, derivative of the string tension with the physical charge. And I will justify this identity from, let's say, a phenomenological perspective later. Now, since we have a string in our effective field theory, we can uh, study the back reaction of the string simply by solving the equations of motions, including the string. And it does make sense to consider a metric concept as this one, which preserves the Poincare symmetry along the direction which are, trans, which are parallel to the string. And if we consider, for instance, the case where there is just a single succion with this scalar potential, when it turns out that the back reaction on the succion is this one, which depends logarithmically on the distance r from the string. And what is pretty remarkable is that this solution actually breaks down at a finite distance from the string, as I was anticipating earlier. This breaking down is also reflected on the string tension. The back reaction on the string tension can be obtained just by replacing the dual succion in the expression of the tension with its uh, uh, solitonic solution. And again, also this uh, expression breaks down at a finite distance from the string. But what is weird here is also that uh, due to the back reaction, actually the string tension goes to zero as we approach the string. Now the crucial point is that uh, this back reaction can be regarded as energy flow of the string tension with the string tension that is considered a proper effective uh, field theory coupling. And this is done by regarding the inverse of the distance from the string as an energy scale. And thus, this uh, back reaction can be written exactly in an energy flow fashion. And uh, the distance at which the back reaction breaks down is then interpreted as a scale at which the strong coupling effect uh, uh, takes place. So let's say from this perspective, it does make sense that the effective field theory breaks down at a finite distance from the string, simply because uh, uh, in that place, the effective field theory enters a strongly coupled regime. And as we move instead towards the string, the theory becomes weaker and weaker coupled. Now, with this technology, you can uh, uh, define properly our repulsive force conjecture for these axionic strings. And in order to do so, we need to know which forces act on the string. So let us consider two of these axionic strings which are parallel between one another. And let us assume that they are, uh, let's say enough close so that the effective field theory does not enter a strongly coupled regime. Then it can be seen that between these two strings there are no gravitational forces. And this is just due to the co-dimension of the objects. There are some scalar forces which are attractive and uh, they depend on the inverse of the distance from the string and uh, they are proportional to the derivative of the string tension squared. 
And then we have electric forces, which are mediated by the gauge two forms, which are instead proportional to the physical charge of the string. Now, the repulsive force conjecture states that there must exist a string, an axionic string in this case, which is a self-repulsive. Namely, it has to verify this uh, inequality. The scalar forces uh, basically have to overcome, uh, no, uh, sorry, the electric forces have to overcome the scalar forces which are attractive. And uh, well, this inequality should hold uh, along the wall RG flow. Now for BPS strings, as the one that I was showing you before, well, actually there is this identity which is uh, tautologically satisfied. And this implies that supersymmetric string simply do not exert forces between one another. Now we can also uh, define a weak gravity conjecture for these axionic strings. Namely, there must exist a super extrema strings which satisfies this uh, uh, inequality, where this gamma is an extremality factor. And of course, the problem here is to determine this extremality factor. An int can come, for instance, from the BPS strings. However, the BPS strings satisfy this uh, equality, which is not quite in the form which is required by the weak gravity conjecture. But however, it can be seen quite easily that for a single scalar field with this scalar potential, actually the derivative of the string tension becomes proportional to the string tension. And this immediately tells you the extremality factor for fundamental axionic strings, which is just, uh, which just depends on this n, which is uh, uh, the no scale factor associated to the scalar potential. If we have multiple scalar fields, the situation is slightly more complicated, but however, one can uh, still uh, uh, run a very similar argument, and one finds this inequality. But the extremality factor is, uh, well, lower bounded by the maximal growth Ni of the succions within the scalar potential. Now, what is very interesting about uh, these axionic strings is that they are, in a sense, detectors of infinite field distance points. Let us first recall that if we approach the string, the succions goes to infinity, which is, let's say, pretty bad. But however, let us see how this is reflected in terms of the distance, the geodesic field distance. Well, it can be seen that the field distance can be recast in terms of the physical string charge. And this integral, can in turn be recast as a, the integral over one over the physical charge integrated over the string tension. Now applying the string with gravity conjecture, the one that I showed you before, one can find that the distance from the string is actually upper bounded by the logarithm of this ratio, where this T zero is, uh, let's say a reference string tension. And here we have a maximal string tension. Now, this has uh, two quite important implications. In particular, if uh, so, the string tension actually fixes the maximal cutoff of the theory. Let's say if the string tension is lower than this cutoff, uh, then quantum oscillations uh, will uh, appear in uh, the effective description, and the effective description would break down. Now, by employing this uh, relation, one can see that this maximal cutoff actually decreases exponentially as the field distance goes to infinity, moving towards the string. On the other hand, the string tension also fixes the masses of the oscillatory modes of the, induced by the string. And well, the fall off of these masses is also strictly fixed by the extremality factor of the string. So as you can see, these two statements combined together do actually identify the distance conjecture. Namely, while we move uh, close to the string, close to the string core, we do actually recover exactly the uh, statements that are predicted by the distance conjecture. So these observations actually led us to propose a new conjecture that we called the, the distant axionic string conjecture. And it states the following. All infinite distance limit of 4D EFT can be realized as an RG flow endpoint of a fundamental axionic string. To be concrete, let us first consider a modular space, which can be quite generic. 
and uh, described within an EFT with a certain cutoff lambda. Now, the modular space is not fully explorable with a finite cutoff. We never encounter infinite uh, distance point. However, it does assume to change the cutoff lambda. Ideally, we can uh, send this uh, lambda to zero. But this is equivalent, as I was showing you before, to moving along the RG flow dictated by the string. And thus we can, let's say, fully explore the modular space by also encountering infinite field distance point by considering a string which uh, triggers a flow of the uh, EFT couplings. So let's say infinite field distance points are in a correspondence to the presence of these axonic strings. So let's say in order to have some uh, more concrete evidence for this conjecture, one should also verify that approaching these uh, uh, strings, these axonic strings, one encounters infinite uh, tower of states which become massless. This is actually the case in uh, many string compatification scenarios. And the tower of states can be given by either KK modes or D0 brains. And it can be seen that the fall off of these masses is actually regulated by the string tension, namely the masses uh, fall off to zero as an integer power of the string tension. But uh, these issues will be illustrated in a paper that will appear soon on the archive. So this concludes the first part about axionic strings. And let us now dive into the membrane part. Now, as uh, done with the strings, we can include membranes as fundamental objects within our effective field theory. Membranes are objects of strict codimension one, and they are electrically coupled to some gauge theory forms. Again, in order to enforce the semi-classical approximation, we need that uh, the membrane tension has to be greater than the cutoff to the power of three. And as we did uh, first thing, we need a proper uh, supersymmetric formulation, which is able to include uh, this gauge three form supersymmetrically. This is achieved by introducing some uh, quite special chiral multiplets called the three form uh, multiplets, which uh, have in their, uh, let's say, auxiliary non-propagating part the gauge three forms. With this chiral multiplet, we can construct uh, this uh, supersymmetric action. And what is important here is that the gauge kinetic function for the gauge three forms does actually depend on this holomorphic period pi i. Now, since in four dimension gauge three forms do not carry any propagating degrees of freedom, they can be easily integrated out. And recalling that gauge three forms are actually dual to some constant fluxes, it can be seen that setting the three forms on shell would produce a potential. This potential is uh, bilinear in the fluxes, which are dual to the gauge three forms. And at least in these n equal one theories can be seen that this potential can be recast in a Kramer-Etal uh, formula by introducing a superpotential. And this superpotential depends on the holomorphic period, the same that enters into the gauge kinetic function. And it is linear in the fluxes FA. Now in this formulation, we can uh, insert uh, membranes with this action with uh, a minimal coupling uh, to the gauge three forms. And here we have the Namugoto term. Now, including a membrane has uh, some interesting phenomenological effects. In fact, uh, due to the presence of the membranes and due to this charge, what actually happens is that the potential is uh, differently defined on the two sides of the membrane. In other words, the potential is always the same, it's always the same bilinear form, but simply the fluxes shift crossing a membrane. Supersymmetry, on the other hand, requires the membrane tension to acquire a very particular form. It has to be linear in the elementary membrane charges, and it has to depend on these periods holomorphically. We can also define the physical membrane charge by simply contracting, again, the bare charges with the gauge uh, kinetic function. And what is remarkable is that here, these uh, supersymmetric membranes satisfy this uh, identity tautologically. This identity relates the derivative of the membrane tension 
to the tension itself and the physical charge of the membrane. And it is pretty interesting to notice that this identity is uh, extremely similar to the potential with these identifications. However, these two identities are not exactly the same. And the reason is that while this potential is expressed in terms of the fluxes, this relation instead involves uh, the elementary charges of the membrane. But however, these two relations would coincide in one case, namely when we have a membrane that interpolates between a region where we don't, we don't have fluxes at all, we have a fluxes region, and a region where we have a non-trivial flux, Fa. And in this case, the charge of the membrane has to coincide with the flux. And thus, in this case, the physical charge of the membrane coincide with the potential. So in the following, I will always consider this sort of generating membrane. So we can also study, as we did first thing, the membrane back reaction. And let me just point out that unlike what happens for strings, here the study of the back reaction is definitely more involved. And uh, however, we can uh, try to move towards some asymptotic limits in field space where the theory is more under control. And in particular, we can exploit the SL2 orbit theorem in order to expand the killer potential and the membrane tension. And we can focus on a particular class of membranes such that their tension is proportional to, uh, the derivative of their tension is proportional to the tension themselves. And uh, the proportionality factor is uh, specified by these R at and Ni, which are the discrete data that specify the asymptotic limit around which we are working. By doing so, we can compute the back reaction of the membrane. We can choose a metric of this form, a domain wall metric, which preserves the Poincaré symmetries along the directions which are parallel to the membrane. And what will, import, what will be important for us is the back reaction onto the membrane tension, which occurs this form, where this y is the uh, transverse distance from the membrane and T star is just a reference uh, membrane tension. As we notice for strings, also this expression for the tension breaks down at a finite distance from the string, which is exactly this one. But however, unlike for strings, here the membrane tension is uh, perfectly regular in the limit as Y goes to zero because uh, this membrane tension simply reduces to the reference tension T star. And again, we can regard this back reaction as energy flow of the membrane tension. And uh, we then identify this uh, breaking distance as the distance at which the strongly coupled, uh, the strong coupling effects start to emerge. And uh, as we move instead towards the membrane, the uh, effective couplings become weaker and weaker. Again, we can use this technology in order to uh, define the refulsive force condition for membranes. We can consider two identical membranes, which are enough close between one another, so that, again, strongly coupled effect will not take place. And between these two membranes, there will be some gravitational forces, which are repulsive, as was already noticed in the 80s and are constant, they do not depend at all on the distance between the two membranes. There will be some scalar forces depending on the derivative of the membrane tension, and these are attractive. And then there are electric forces. This can be either attractive or repulsive according to the signature of this uh, uh, matrix TAB. Now again, we can uh, uh, formulate a repulsive force conjecture by simply requiring that uh, there must exist a membrane which is self-repulsive. And this inequality has to hold along the wall energy flow whenever it is defined. And well, the identity that I showed you before for membranes here takes a particular meaning, namely that, uh, well, two BPS membranes do not exert any net force between one another. And uh, well, we can also try to define a weak gravity conjecture for these fundamental membranes. 
but I find that there must exist a super extremal membranes which obeys this inequality. And again, here the problem is in trying to determine the extremality factor. For BPS membranes, well, again, the expression of the charge to tension ratio is not exactly in the form that is required by the weak gravity conjecture, simply because of this dependence from the scalar fields. However, one can see that considering the asymptotic limits that I was showing you before, well, the uh, charge, the physical charge of the membrane becomes proportional to the tension, and the proportionality simply gives you the extremality factor, which is again specified by all the discrete data that distinguish the asymptotic limits that we are considering. And let us now focus in particular on these extremal membranes. These extremal membranes can be, for instance, generating membranes that can interpolate between a region with a zero flux and a region with a non-trivial flux. And for these membranes, I recall that the potential is simply given by the physical charge of these membranes. Now, for this class of membranes, the derivative of the tension of the membranes is proportional to the membrane tension. But uh, since, uh, while well, these membranes are extremal, an analogous relation holds for the physical charge of the membrane, namely that the derivative of the physical charge is proportional to the physical charge of the membrane. But since these membranes is generating, then this can uh, be recast as an expression for the potential, namely the derivative of the potential is proportional to the potential itself. But this is just the Sitter conjecture, which states that the slope of the potential has to be constrained in this way. What is remarkable here is that, uh, well, we can immediately identify the uh, parameter C, which was left unspecified in the original version of the conjecture. Because here, this parameter C is directly related to the discrete data that classify the asymptotic limit. And eventually can be related to the extremality parameter of the string. So to conclude, what I have tried to show you is that, uh, well, generically the back reaction of uh, local dimension objects such as strings and membranes in 4D may introduce uh, some problems in EFT. But however, these problems can be treated by simply regarding the back reaction as an RG flow of the effective couplings. And by using this observation, we were able to properly formulate a repulsive force conjecture and a weak gravity conjecture for strings and membranes. And uh, we have seen that a weak gravity conjecture for strings implies the distance conjecture. While on the other hand, weak gravity conjecture saturating membranes imply the Sitter conjecture. Of course, uh, uh, the observations that I told you should apply to uh, dimensions which are different uh, with respect to four, provided, however, that we keep fixed the co-dimensions of the objects. Namely, uh, instead of considering strings, we just consider uh, generic co-dimension to objects and the same for membranes. And it would be also quite interesting to try to test uh, this conjecture in contexts which are not uh, supersymmetric, which can also be very interesting in order to study Bakwa decay and relate our RG flow notion for membranes to the decay of non supersymmetric Bakwa. So thank you very much for the, for the attention. Great. Let's, uh, thanks, Stefano. Um, are there any questions? I guess, oh, Miguel has a question. Hi, Stefano. Uh, very nice. So, so uh, I was wondering, so, so in principle, the, the, the distant axion extreme conjecture I apply also, I would like to apply to uh, also to the effective field theory. It doesn't have to be the modelized space, right? If, even if it has a potential, as long as I can describe the effective field theory, I should be able to apply the distant axion extreme conjecture. Uh, I would expect so. Mm -hmm. And, and is, is, there, is there any way to relate the two? So your talk had two parts, right? Like the strings and the membranes. And sometimes mm -hmm. strings can end on membranes, right? Is, 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 uh, is some, can you relate the extremity parameters of the two or 
Is there anything uh, you want to say there? Uh, yes, indeed. There can be cases where uh, strings and membranes uh, should appear together, for instance, due to Friedwitten anomaly cancellation mechanism. Uh, let's say we don't have a clean formulation where both appear at the same time. But, well, let's say that what we can treat is the case where, for instance, uh, uh, we have a flow dictated by, let's say, strings of a membrane, and on top of this flow, we include a string of a or a membrane, right? So that let's say, the the underlying flow is not uh, uh, heavily destroyed by the addition of these objects, right? But uh, uh, yes, indeed, it would be very interesting to try to understand what happens when both are present. Okay, thank which you. Which is not required by consistency. And I just, uh, have, oh, sorry. So I just, yeah. can you just ask one technicality? It's that like you're, do you have the ex an expression for the extremality factor for the, for the, for the membranes? Yes. It, it I mean, it's, it's probably impossible, but it, it looked like it could become imaginary. Uh, if I tune the integers in a, is, does that mean anything? Like if, if the integers are negative? Uh, yes, it can be. Are not, can that happen? Is that impossible? Does it mean anything? Is that like uh, a that I should impose on my, I don't know. Uh, I think that this can, uh, so uh, the fact that this uh, expression here can be negative can uh, happen whenever we do not have scalars at all. We just have a membrane, but no scalars. The membrane tension does not depend on any scalar. So then uh, uh, what, what, how should I understand imaginary externality factor? Um, well, uh, let me say that uh, probably the inclusion of the scalars, at least in this, uh, uh, in this, from this perspective, is necessary in order to have consistency. Okay. Okay. Good. So let's say turning off the scalars, uh, all the scalars at least, uh, is uh, quite problematic. Okay. I mean, I, I would not expect that uh, uh, that framework to be fully consistent. Okay, all right, thanks. Thanks a lot. Thank you for the questions. Uh, I think Ben has a question. Uh, yes, thanks for the nice talk. Um, it seems like you're, you're trying to argue for the original de Sitter conjecture, uh, but we know there's some problems with that conjecture. Um, have you thought about, is there some facet of your argument which would only apply under certain conditions about the second derivative of the potential? Uh, well, we have not explored uh, what happens uh, with the second derivatives. Right, but you seem to be saying that the original conjecture is true without caveat, right? So that, uh, yes, probably, yes. that probably puts the standard model in the swamp line. Uh, yes, but let me maybe just be slightly more precise. Uh, we are taking, of course, the naive, the original statement of the conjecture, but we are considering uh, uh, asymptotic limits in the field space where the theory should uh, be more controllable. Uh, so let's say that is the important caveat that we are considering here. We are at the asymptotic limits. I see. But uh, yeah, of course it would be definitely interesting to study the what happens with the uh, second derivatives, but we simply didn't explore this possibility. Thanks for the question. Yeah, thank you. I think uh, for one final question, Naomi. Uh, hi, thanks for the nice talk. Um, I was just wondering about the extremality factor. So to find it, are you just finding the, the charge to mass ratio of these things at infinite distance? Or are you actually finding like a, a black brain solution or something in your effective theory and reading it off from there? Uh, well, the extremality factor is, uh, well, uh, let's say, intrinsically related to the fundamental object. However, the fact that we can identify this extremality factor is because a uh, natural, let's say here, domain world solution exists. So, let's say the, uh, it is related with the existence of a solution with these uh, metric concepts. Oh, okay, cool. So let's um, say so this would be 
uh, um, says yes, generalization to a different dimension of what happens with black holes. Sweet, thanks. Thanks for the question. Great. Um, so let's again thank uh, Gregory and Stefano for their very nice talks today. Um, thanks for coming back to uh, the seminar series. Um, next week, we'll have Craig Lowry and Minky Kim. They'll be telling us about some things to be announced. Uh, look for an email. And uh, yeah, uh, have a nice week. <laughs>